Since biblical times, elders have held a revered place in most societies. From 2010 to 2050, experts estimate that the number of Americans over the age of 65 will rise from its current level of 35 million all the way to 85 million. The elderly are the fastest growing segment of our population. Times changed in South Dakota. Not too long ago, the elderly lived with their children or get by themselves in the same town as their children. Neighbors, neighborhoods were stable, and the elderly could count on being assisted by their neighbors. Today, due to lower birth rates, more mobile society, increased divorce rates, and more importantly, a greater lifespan, we have many more of our elderly citizens living alone with no one to help them. This makes the elderly right candidates for abuse and criminal actions by the unscrupulous. One cannot open a newspaper without finding another article about a new scam to separate people from their money. All too many of these con artists target the elderly because they are more trusting and may be less likely to recognize the situation for what it really is. Get rich quick. Price scan this. Sure buy investment are all offered to the unwary. There are false threats to obtain information and or money by those masquerading as representatives of a government agency, such as the Internal Revenue Service. Some salesmen also fly their trade down the elderly. Why does a 98-year-old need life insurance? Who will manage the elderly's assets when that time comes is also an issue. If children exist, they may be many hundred miles away. Even if children are in the locale, they may not be <coughs> ideal candidates for such a responsible position. They may have a conflict of interest in how their parents' assets are used or saved. They may be tempted to probate their parents' estate while the parent is still living, such as the biblical prodigal son. As one probate judge from another state sadly stated, will contest had virtually gone away. The greedy are not willing to wait that long anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, some seniors are susceptible to undue influence of others, especially those they trust. One state ran a check on guardianships for the elderly in its jurisdiction. It found that 20% of the guardianship files showed sufficient evidence of outright fraud to justify further investigation. Moreover, this check did not include the vast and more commonplace powers of attorneys and joint accounts, which are virtually free from state regulation and protection. Many of our seniors live on limited or fixed incomes. For them, retaining an attorney for legal assistance may be beyond their means. Inflation and recession have eaten into their ability to support themselves adequately. Others have simply outlived their savings. Social Security was enacted in the 1930s, the retirement age was set at 65 because the average life expectancy was only 66. Sadly, instances of physical abuse of the elderly are also becoming more frequent. Experts tell us that this physical abuse is vastly underreported in proportion to its occurrence. This abuse can be caused by indifferent neglect or outright attack. In some instances, physical abuse is tied to an adult child who is addicted to drugs and is attempting to get money for more drugs. Elder abuse is not unique to South Dakota. The Conference of Chief Justices has identified this area of the law as one it needs to focus on nationally. From this, we may get useful suggestions and information on how to effectively deal with these problems. Courts need to become more proactive in the protection of the elderly and their assets. Courts also need to participate in programs with members of the bar and state agencies to assist our elders who have made South Dakota what it is today. Those of us who have not reached this age status, if lucky, are headed in that direction. I am pleased to report that the Access to Justice Program State Bar of South Dakota has commenced a pilot project in the Aberdeen area to assist seniors. Attorneys who join the program agree to prepare traditional wills, living wills, powers of attorney, and other documents 
for those elderly who cannot afford to pay for their preparations. The goal of the Access to Justice program is to use this pilot project to identify those legal needs which are the greatest and then tailor and implement a program in that direction on a statewide basis. At the end of a horrific civil war, which cost 600,000 lives, the victorious Union troops celebrated the Grand March of Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. When they marched past the newly completed dome on the United States Capitol, they saw a huge banner which simply said, to our victorious troops, the one national debt that cannot be repaid. Our elders are the people who built South Dakota, <coughs> overcame dust bowls, defeated Hitler, and turned back communism. A similar unpayable debt is owed them. A friend of mine named Clarence, who's a bit of a philosopher, observed, they taught us better by example than we probably learned. Question two. Will the current economic problems increase caseloads in the courts? Common sense and the lessons of history indicate that economic downturns increase some court caseloads. Many people have lost a job or a home or both. For others, the stress of increasing debt or an uncertain future increases anxiety. It invites attempted escapes from the jury reality they have through the abuse of alcohol and drugs. <coughs> All other things being equal, I anticipate more crime in certain areas, possibly including DUIs, drug abuse, bad checks, domestic assaults, no proof of insurance, and like crimes. The number of divorces and protection orders will likely increase. Child support payments may fall. Foreclosures and collection suits may increase. As stress increases within a family due to economic problems, it will make it harder to work with the family to resolve problems that got the family into court in the first place. In many instances, the misfortunes are not caused by the people who now feel their effects. The only solution on a large scale is the reversal of our current economic downturn. In the meantime, the court system will be as understanding of the situation as possible, while still applying the law as it has been enacted. Question three. The laws the legislature passes increase caseloads in the courts and cost to taxpayers. Some changes in laws have that effect. For example, in 1987, the legislature increased the drinking age from 18 to 21. I was a circuit judge at that time, and my caseload for underage consumption significantly increased. In 2002, the legislature dropped the alcohol level for a violation of driving while under the influence from 0.10% to 0.08%. That year, DUI arrest jumped 16%. For the previous two years before that change, DUIs had shown an overall decline of 25%. Now, I'm in no way criticizing the decision of the legislature to make either one of these changes. These policy decisions were supported by a good many reasons, including a push for stricter enforcement of alcohol-related crimes, in a public that's less tolerant of such conduct. However, all of this does point to an increase in court caseloads and corresponding increase in costs. In reality, it's the old question of whether the coffee cup is half full or half empty. If the legislature passes a law, it's for a purpose. If the increased scope of the criminal law did not result in an increased caseload, one might ask whether the change was necessary in the first place. Question four, when will the unified judicial system go into electronic filing of documents? For many years, the unified judicial system has been working on a complete overhaul of its computer system to streamline all our court processes. Such a project is long overdue. Our present computer system is about to age out and the data needs updating. After years of studying, whether it was most effective to attempt to do an in-house solution or an off-the-shelf system, we concluded the magnitude of the entire project dictated that an off-the-shelf system would be the most cost-effective and the least time-consuming. Last October, following years of preparation and testing, we selected a vendor. The company we chose has considerable experience in 
providing systems exclusively targeted to the needs of the judiciary. Similar systems have been installed in both federal and state courts around the country. We are significantly behind the ongoing projects in our neighboring states of North Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa. As you can imagine, the UJS deals with literally tons of paper. Records are created for each court case and must be accessible to all parties involved. The trial record for one individual case that arrived on appeal before our Supreme Court filled 32 copy paper boxes. We maintain documents for many years, and it takes significant personnel time and considerable storage space. The new system will allow our records in the future to be digitized and archived so that nothing will be lost. The new system will drastically cut the amount of paper used and enable information to be distributed electronically. It will reduce time spent in filing and maintaining hundreds of thousands of new records we deal with each year. Our new system will be coordinated with those South Dakota agencies that interact with us. This means, to use an example, that a traffic ticket written on a remote roadside can be electronically transferred almost instantaneously to the appropriate court courts and a fine can be paid online with a credit card. This will increase our ability to promptly collect fines and costs. With electronic filing of legal documents, all other court processes will also be just as efficient. It will enable us to share information as part of an integrated justice environment and improve our service to the public. The new system will also allow for electronic scheduling of judicial hearings. It will minimize costs by optimizing the scheduling of court sessions, provide for speedy trial dates, coordinating with jury members, and integrating the schedules of law enforcement officers. It will also have an automated adult and juvenile probation supervision component and allow for more efficient management of probationers. With this system, South Dakota's judiciary will become more efficient, more accessible, and more responsive to the needs of South Dakota citizens. Such major improvements are not free for the asking. We have to pay as we go into the world of technology like any other type of improvement. The Unified Judicial System has given serious consideration on how to pay for this project. It is clear to us that the current pressures on the general fund will not allow that as a source of revenue. The justices have concluded that it is appropriate for those who use the judicial system to be asked to finance this improvement through a modest increase in fees that the UJS collects when cases are filed for us. As an example, if you are convicted of DUI, it would cost you an additional $20. User fees have worked well in virtually every other area of state government. I will be asking this legislature to approve these modest increases in our fees. Even with these increases, South Dakota's fees are significantly less than those of neighboring states. Question five. Why is there such a variation in criminal sentencing? In crafting sentences for criminal acts, this legislature has widely concluded that the punishment should fit the crime. To implement this philosophy, wide latitude is given the sentencing judge. For example, crime of manslaughter can carry with it any sentence from probation to life in prison. A factor that affects a criminal sentence is the defendant's prior criminal record. Last spring, 780 of 2,000 inmates in South Dakota were repeat offenders. The state's habitual criminal statutes recognize that repeat offenses by an individual call for harsher sentences for the protection of the public. Other jurisdictions have opted for forms of sentencing guidelines. Under the strictest sentencing guidelines, a judge cannot take into account anything but the crime the defendant committed. The judge cannot consider the defendant's prior criminal history, other facts of the crime, recommendations to the victims, or the possibility of future repeat behavior. These guidelines are not very different from looking up the tax in an IRS tax table. No individual considerations are involved. There is little pressure for the judge simply to look up the sentence in the sentencing table. 
the end result, however, is essentially assembly line justice rather than justice that fits the crime and the criminal. There is no doubt that South Dakota sentencing statutes give our judges wide latitude. That's the best way to deal with criminals as individuals. However, it does place on the judge the responsibility to balance competing interests in order to fashion appropriate individual sentences. Several months ago, I received a letter from a man I sentenced for embezzlement nearly 25 years ago. At that time, I felt he was a victim of alcohol addiction rather than a thief. I gave him a suspended imposition of sentence. I told him at sentencing I was doing him no favors because he was walking around with the key to the penitentiary in his pocket. He decided by either abstaining from his addiction or giving into it whether that key would be used. In his letter, this man reported that not only had he been sober for the past 20 years, he had gone on to become a certified chemical dependency counselor, helping others to overcome the addiction he had successfully battled. He said, I feel it is important to let you know that I took the most of what I was and who I am and made the changes necessary in my life. I want to sincerely thank you for helping me get my life back on track. Thus, as with this individual, the sense of criminal act one side does not fit all. Question six, what do you see as the future of probation in South Dakota as part of criminal sentencing? At the request of last year's legislature, the Unified Judicial System spent a significant amount of time preparing a report on the future of sentencing in South Dakota. This report emphasizes forms of non-institutional punishment. I respectfully recommend that you review this report and its detailed options for the future. Currently, there are over 9,000 individuals on probation or related types of supervision in South Dakota. Another 2,000 people are incarcerated in prison. Without probation, many of those who violated the law would simply be turned loose because we did not build enough prisons to hold all of them or pay for ongoing operational costs. The average cost of a person on probation is only $3 per day or $1,095 a year. Compare that to the daily cost of incarceration of $63.69 at the men's prison and $69.38 a day at the women's prison. Thus, for every three persons who are successfully placed on probation rather than sent to prison, the savings equals the annual salary of a court service officer. The intensity of the probation services is tailored to fit the crime and the person committing the crime. While the goal of no further criminal activity is obviously the centerpiece, other goals such as restitution of the victim of the crime are also involved. To accomplish this, the period of probation often is not one of short duration. The average runs from three and a half to five years. As an example of the success of probation services, the third judicial circuit statistics show that each month Approximately 1% of those who are on probation violate that probation and are sent to prison. This is a rate of 12% per year who fail. Thus, 88% a year who successfully complete probation or successfully remain on probation without revocation. This rate in the Third Circuit has remained constant for three years. When you consider that the Unified Judicial System has over 9,000 people on probation, this bodes well for the proposition that probation is a success in the high majority of cases and saves the taxpayers a considerable sum over the cost of incarceration. Those who remain in their community on probation, hopefully maintain their own homes, have jobs, support their families, and pay taxes. If a person is incarcerated, none of that happens. But this is not to say that all who violate the criminal laws are deserving of probation. Some commit crimes so serious that their acts, along with the future protection of society, demand incarceration. Question seven. Why isn't there more supervision of juveniles on probation, especially those who are ordered to do community service? While the prevailing purpose of the 
adult sentencing offenders is punishment. The purpose of dealing with juveniles is rehabilitation. Because of that, many juveniles are placed on probation under the supervision of a UJS court service officer. In recent years, the caseloads have been heavy. The court service officer who supervises the area of South Dakota that prompted this question carries a caseload of 150 adults and juveniles. Not only must he accept the attempt to check on his probationers, he must also see to it that they meet their other legal obligations, such as restitution, payment of fines, and community service. Nationally, experts suggest that a court service officer carry a caseload of no more than 80. When we call upon our court service officers to carry caseloads of 150, double the recommended load, something has to give. As one wit with, at that rate, the only ones you dare put under such kind of supervision are those who do not need to be there in the first place. Last year, the number of juveniles placed on probation in South Dakota went up by 16%. Adults placed on probation went up by 8%. Both figures are well in excess of the national increase of only 2%. Caseloads went up by 16% for juveniles and the same number of court service officers as we had the year before and the year before that. Despite these large increases, the UJS did not request any additional court service officers because of our awareness of the state's finances. A couple of years ago, I had a chance to renew the acquaintance of a childhood friend. We talked about our formative years and how we were influenced by parents, teachers, clergy, scout leaders, and neighbors. My friend looked at me and he said, you could say we were raised by the whole town. In that era, he was right. Today, that no longer exists in many instances, and those tasks, all too often, fall upon court service officers. You can stretch this rubber band approach, and it will still be a rubber band. However, increased stretching will eventually result in the rubber band breaking. Question 8. Last year, the legislature authorized the funding of two more circuit judges. What makes a good judge? Before I proceed with this answer, I would like to thank this legislature and Governor Rounds for the authorization of two additional judgeships in our two busiest judicial circuits in the state, the Second Judicial Circuit and the Seventh Judicial Circuit. I believe these additional judgeships will solve our docket congestion problems for the foreseeable future. The Governor acted promptly in the selection process, and we now have Judge Robin Jacobson Palmer on the bench of the Second Judicial Circuit and Judge Mary P. Thorstensen in the Seventh Judicial Circuit. Moreover, the Governor also appointed Judge Larry Long to replace Justice Severson in the Second Judicial Circuit after Justice Severson was appointed to the Supreme Court. There are no checklists to determine what makes a good judge. Entire books could be written on the subject, and there would not be complete agreement. On the day I became a judge, a veteran retired judge told me, David, the difference between being a lawyer and a judge is the difference between eating in a restaurant and running one. Now, with 25 years judicial experience, I could not agree more. I think it helps that our judges often live in the communities where they work. While they may serve adjoining counties also, the visits are frequent enough that the judge soon becomes acquainted with those neighboring counties. The ability to make up one's mind is essential. The volume of cases the judge sees calls for an attentive listening of facts and the ability to apply the law to those facts in an orderly manner. Finally, patience and a good sense of humor and a lot of common sense help greatly. While it's not my intention to go into great detail today, I believe our state has an outstanding effort of filling judicial vacancies. Unlike other states that choose judges in partisan political elections or through multi-million dollar campaigns, our system seeks to put those with qualified backgrounds in judicial positions. This gives our judges the public image of being beholden to no major contributors, a single political party, or special interests. Does a contributor of a large sum of money to a judicial candidate do so solely because he or she is interested in the impartial administration of justice or good government? Human nature leads many people to conclude, probably not.
Question 9. Beyond the name, who is our new justice? The newest justice of the South Dakota Supreme Court is the Honorable Glenn Severson of Sioux Falls. Justice Severson practiced law for many years in Trump. After that, he was appointed the circuit judge of the Second Judicial Circuit, which is where he was raised. When presiding Judge Meyerhander became Justice Meyerhander, I appointed Judge Severson to be presiding judge of the busy Judicial Circuit of the state. Besides his administrative duties and his heavy court caseload, he somehow found time to work with Minnehaha County to add two additional floors to his courthouse and work with Lincoln County to completely renovate his lovely Victorian era courthouse. For a change of pace, he enjoys retiring to the family farm to do a bit of farm work. Uh, please help me welcome our new justice. Thieves who wish to steal our identity to use it as the basis. 
basis to scout with our assets or commit fraud using our name. The law is evolving. However, it is clearly a case of the law trying to catch up with rapid changes in technology and society. Given the ongoing pace of change, that catch up may be a continual process with total legal protection never achieved. As we watch the sunset over a lake which we both love, my philosopher friend Clarence often says, God's not making it on shoreline these days. What he gave us, we have to protect. Likewise, the loss of privacy is a cause for concern and protection. And in the words of a popular song from several decades ago, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. However, the South Dakota Supreme Court does not make the law. It merely interprets the Constitution of laws. While we might think we know how to effectively respond, that response may be beyond our judicial powers. In conclusion, the questions you have asked and my answers are as diverse as the many tasks which the unified judicial system undertakes in the execution of its constitutional and its statutory duties. Many of these questions and answers point out the problems we face today and our future challenges. As I commence my third term as your Chief Justice, you would think by now there would be nothing new for me to be faced with or solved that I had not seen before. However, there are very few of my days which do not bring something across my desk for which I cannot simply look up the answer in the book because it's done, been done that way in the past. The first step for solving problems is identifying their nature. From there, potential solutions can be debated and solutions implemented. Times are tough. However, times have been tough before. In 1981, they were tough. And in that year, when he took office, President Ronald Reagan gave our nation inspiration when he observed, we're not, as some would have us believe, doomed to an inevitable decline. I do not believe in a faith that will fall on us no matter what we do. I do believe in a faith that will fall on us if we do nothing. So, with all our creative energy at our command, let us begin an era of national renewal. Thank you very much.